Good morning, Internet. Uh, this is CJ once again with another commented video, uh, commentary art video. Uh, I posted this video, um, Valley of the Rules, a while back. Um, and I decided that this was one of the videos that I was going to put a commentary on, so um, here I am reposting it with an audio commentary. Um, so real quick uh, to talk about Valley of the Rules. Um, this was originally an entry for a char uh, for Environment of the Week, not Character of the Week, but it was um, an entry for the Environment of the Week uh, challenge prompt over at conceptart.org. Um, so yeah, uh, the prompt was inspired by an artist, uh, Aqua Sixty, oh, if I'm not wrong, um, on Deviant Artists or on DeviantArt.com. Um, yeah, uh, Eric, the guy who posted the prompt, was inspired by one of Aqua Sixio's. Uh, artwork and so he came up with the prompt value of the rules and made it into a challenge essentially and so here I am and here's my entry for the challenge um, I initially had a strong image in my head when the f when I was first exposed to the prompt when I saw the prompt value of the rules the very first image that came to my head was that first thumbnail sketch that I drew earlier in this video but then I decided, you know what, I'm kind of limiting myself with just this one idea. You know, I wasn't really sold by sold to that idea anyway. So I decided to reset and start all over again. Uh, this time using Richard Wright's approach to thumbnailing. Um, I do believe I learned this thumbnail approach from Richard Wright. And basically what you do is you marquee select uh, a few boxes on your canvas and then just lay down a bunch of shades, lay down a bunch of shades or colors. Um, in my case I lay down a bunch of shades and then just make sense out of the noise. You know you zoom in in one of the boxes and try to make an illustration out of the noise that was created and so here I am coming up with thumbnail concepts based on uh, the noise. So Essentially, I ended up with the same thumbnail again. Um, after doing that thumbnail process and looking through all the art that I created, I was like, okay, well, maybe this is the best one. So I went ahead and went with the idea. And the idea is this forest with this magical glowing um, holes within them. Um, basically, my idea for the glowing symbols glowing runes uh, basically the glowing part of the trees will end up being symbols eventually uh, as you'll see um, in the final illustration but um, yeah my idea for the glowing runes came from an earlier illustration I did for a CG society challenge um, it was such a long time ago I forgot what the challenge was but I kind of employed a similar um, motif in that illustration which is glowing runes or glowing symbols essentially and so I, I thought hey maybe that would be cool to you know redo uh, and so here I am kind of sort of redoing well not really redoing that illustration because that illustration is completely different from this one but um, basically using a similar aspect from that old illustration and putting it into this new illustration um, so yeah um, eventually though e even though I'm working on this sketch right now of this you know forest um, I ended up changing my idea again and as you'll see later on uh, in about a few minutes or so uh, it's because I still just was not happy with the whole idea of just a simple forest, you know. And what ended up happening was, you know, after I laid down the base colors for this one, you know, and kind of passed it along to family and friends to have a look at it, you know, 
um, after getting their feedback, I still was not completely satisfied with what I was working with. Um, so what I did was I did a Google search for the word, you know, forest. Um, I googled search images of forest. And I came upon an image of two boys rowing their boats through a swamp. And that's kind of like when things clicked in my head, you know, that image kind of gave me an idea that, you know, maybe I should flood the forest, you know. And so thus, therefore, the idea of the final illustration just came to my head, which is this idea that the valley of the rules is so sacred to people and to the priesthood and to the monks who, you know, study the runes and symbols of the trees or whatnot. Uh, the place is so sacred that the priests will go do anything just to be in that area. And so if the area is like flooded, for example, you know, the priests will brave through freezing cold water or, you know, warm cold water or whatnot, you know, just, just to study the place and just to be, you know, connected to the area. So... And I kind of thought that that was like a cool idea, essentially, because, you know, um, we all know uh, people when they're very devoted to their fate, you know, they will do anything for their fate. And so, you know, giving an extra challenge to their fate, you know, just to show that they are faithful kind of proves... Well, let me backtrack that train of thought. Um, but yeah, like having a flooded forest and the priests going through the flooded waters and, you know, dealing with it, you know, just to get their worship on is is proof that they are faithful people. That's what I'm trying to get at. Wow, I'm so wordy in my head sometimes. I'm just trying to get that out. I, I couldn't think of the right words. But yeah, that's the idea for an illustration and so instead of just having like a regular for forest I decided to just flood the whole place it's like well, why not <laughs> flood the whole place um, and yeah that that was my final illustration um, so after this little thumbnail process what I decided to do since one of the big things that I was having issues with with this uh, thumbnail was the perspective I mean it feels like that the perspective is right but it also doesn't look right to me you know so I mean I couldn't really figure out what was going on so what I decided to do was fire up blender and did a 3d mock-up I spent about like an hour or two laying down a few boxes to kind of indicate where things are to kind of indicate where the trees are you know put a few lamps put put down a few lights you know just to get an idea where the light sources are and um, made a few boxes for the humans and the robots their robot servants um, just simple shapes really I mean the whole thing didn't even really take me more than 30 40 minutes to model honestly it was like that quick to model it it was the lighting it's always the lighting that takes a while for me because you know you just gotta have the right look you know so I, I set up the lighting con the lighting and the materials I, I spent another hour on it so altogether I spent about an hour and a half to two hours like laying out a 3d mock-up um, and then of course there was the rendering which took a lot longer uh, I think I spent like a whole night rendering it so but yeah, um, in the next few minutes, you'll see it. Um, you'll see this 3D mock-up that I did, this 3D render that I did. And I essentially ended up using that 3D base as... Or that 3D image as my base for my illustration, you know, to kind of ground me on... Um, to help ground me on all the perspective issues that I was running into with this particular image.
I spent quite a long time working on this thumbnail I realized that looking back at it now thumbnails should really just be quick I mean yeah you can develop a thumbnail for an hour or two but judging from the work I've put into so far it feels like I've worked on it for more than two hours or so uh, it feels a lot more detailed than it should be um, thumbnails really need to go a lot quicker um, because you need to iterate more you need to generate more uh, thumbnails so it's always uh, a good idea to go through this part of the process quicker than than what I just did just now and I just remembered I ev eventually ended up putting color on top of it I think just to get a good color idea or just to get an idea of what the colors would be like let's see if I yep there I am putting down colors um, so yeah um, thumbnails yeah I guess you can do a color uh, thumbnail uh, just to get you guys a good idea for you know color swatches and color keys um, for this one I didn't really feel like I mean looking back at it I didn't I don't really think I should have gone to as much detail on this as I did but you know I did I guess I wanted to go above and beyond <laughs> for this thumbnail But yeah, a lot of the sketch just got thrown out in favor for the other idea that came to my head eventually. And there's my first draft. And here you can see the 3D render that I came up with out of Blender. Um, I skipped recording the, the Blender part. Um, I should have recorded it so you guys could have gotten a glimpse of how I work with Blender. Um, but that's okay because there will be a few videos um, Oh, there are a few videos out already of me working with Blender. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in seeing me do some 3D, just head on over to my channel and watch the videos with me working on Blender. Um, but yeah, so I, I made that 3D render and essentially used that as a base to do my illustration on. I'm coming up with a rough sketch of 
where I want things to be and how the general look of things are going to be. You can see me sketch out the foreground characters, the robot, servant, uh, and the priest monk uh, bowing down to the runes. Um, and here I'm drawing another set of characters, uh, another set of priests going through the Valley of the Rules, essentially. And uh, so yeah, I'm laying things down. Um, when I did the 3D render, obviously uh, things got a lot clearer for me as to how the perspective was going to be and how uh, everything was in relationship in relation to all the other shapes in the uh, illustration. So in this case, like I, I know how big I needed to draw my humans compared to the trees and how small or tall or big the trees are in comparison to all the other trees and all the other plants. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have gotten an idea how to draw those out if I hadn't done the 3D mock-up. Um, so doing 3D mock-ups um, for your illustration helps a lot if you run into problems like that where you can figure out perspective or you're having perspective issues. Um, another good advantage to doing 3D mock-ups is that um, you get lighting information, you know. Uh, so in this case, um, I got a good general idea of how the lighting was going to be and you know uh, which objects were going to be well lit and which objects are going to be not well lit. Um, so and doing 3D mockups is good. Uh, if you have the time and you can spare the time, I would suggest um, just firing up Blender uh, or any of your favorite 3D apps and just set a few you know objects down uh, they don't have to be su super perfectly detailed they could just be as simple as boxes like the one I use for this one you know I just use boxes and a bunch of cylinders just to kind of indicate what uh, those shapes are going to be or just kind to kind of indicate where things were going to be um, so yeah And here I am laying down um, a bunch of photos to photo bashing. Um, I have a totally different approach to photo bashing. A lot of people who photo bash keep the photos and kind of just paint over it. They don't really do what I do, which is I kind of smudge the photos down uh, and kind of blend them in into the background colors. Um, what it does, my doing that essentially uh, let me try to rephrase that um, the reason why I blend my photos in is because um, I have a tendency to not like the pasted look of the photo sometimes in in photo bash pieces it really depends on who's doing the photo bashing because there's some photo bash artists out there who does such a good job with their photo bash that it just you know the composition looks great it looks perfect me on the other hand like I get stuck into the whole uncanny valley look um, when I try to do my photo bash um, leaving them as is or just like painting over it without blending them into the background I, I even though it works I typically don't like the look because you know maybe it's because it's my work and I'm overly critical of my work or maybe it's just the uncanny valley I, I'm not really quite sure what the reason is but for me, my solution to my not liking the uh, photo bash look is to just blend everything in. So typically what happens um, when, I, when I photo bash is that I, I won't only do one session of photo bash, I will do multiple sessions of photo bash. So this is essentially my first session of photo bashing that you will see me do throughout this whole illustration. You know, I grab a bunch of photos, you know, put them on top of, you know, my base paint 
you know, add a bunch more, do light tweaks, do, you know, multiply fixes and color dodge fixes, then merge them all into one layer, then blend them all in, then detail a little bit, and then start the process all over again. And I just keep doing that. Um, that's kind of like the flow that I've been doing uh, as of late. Now, whether or not this prolongs my illustration or not, I, I don't really think that's the case because the other illustration I did that involved a forest and, and, and involved me doing multiple photo bashing uh, was the illustration um, Dad's Home. And then that illustration only took me 17 hours. This one took me 55 hours. Uh, yeah, it took me a long time to do this one because um, it's just a super detailed piece. But um, Dad's Home, on the other hand, was just a 17 hour long piece. And I did multiple instances of photo bashing on that one too. So I, I don't really think that me going through multiple sessions of photo bashing prolongs me or delays me by any means um, I guess it's just really up to the piece um, but yeah I, I like the ending look of that way better than if I was to just do one photo bash session and then just like paint on top of it and then call it a day <laughs> I that doesn't work for me you know I typically photo bash blend everything all together in one layer you know, paint, 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 then photo bash some more when I feel like I need to photo bash some more, you know, and then do some tweaks with lighting, then put them all in one layer, then blend, 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 and then paint, 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 and then again, if I feel like photo bashing some more, repeat the process once more. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I go through when I do my photo bashing. Um, and that's how I approach photo bashing essentially which is a totally different approach to just me just strictly painting um, so yeah but yeah I just employ different techniques um, for every illustration that I work with because every illustration you work with will call for different methods to solve whatever problems you're having problems with you know um, so yeah, uh, knowing a lot of techniques and a lot of approaches would definitely help you or definitely help any artist um, in troubleshooting illustrations. So yeah. So I'm about to be done with this um, base paint of sort. That's what I've been calling it. Um, the base layer that I kind of paint stuff on. I I'm almost done with this base layer and I'm about to combine it with um, that first thumbnail that I did with the forest that with just the regular forest without the water. And I put them to I put those two together in one piece, which is kind of what you're seeing right now. And then I put it up for a vote between my family and friends. And I don't remember who won the vote. All I remember was that I was just so awestruck with the with this one with the water swamp forest area imagery that I just decided to just go for it like I, I'm not sure if people voted for this one or not but I just remembered that I really really like this image a lot more than the first one I did and I decided that I was just gonna pursue this one and so you see me start pursuing it uh, in this video right now
So this piece is very unique because I did a lot of special effects in this piece. Um, I separated the underground underwater part into its own layer and then it did a bunch of water effects uh, layer uh, like a reflection layer and a few color dodge layers um, and I set them up quite early on in the illustration you know I separated all those three different uh, layers because um, I knew that separating them would have been a lot quicker and a lot easier to work with than if I was to all paint them in one layer which is you know my favorite thing to do so you see me set it up right now separating everything in layers all the water effects layers and whatnot um, yeah I really had a lot of issues with the value range of this one. Um, it kept. I, I knew that the whole scene needed to be dark because it was going to be a night scene, but I didn't. I, I couldn't figure out how dark I'm getting. The problem with working on one workstation or on one computer is that um, you, monitors are basically needed to be calibrated or. Okay, uh, <laughs> let me backtrack. Uh, monitors display colors differently. Some monitor will display darks a little lighter, while some monitors will display darks a little darker. And so, as an artist, it's always very important to calibrate your monitor. And I went through a few rounds of monitor calibration with with my monitor, but I did I didn't use like specific hardware calibration tools because there's actual hardware cal calibration tools out there um, so this piece even though it looks fine and it looks great in my in my monitor I, I know that it has um, it looks dark on my iPhone and so um, towards the end of this illustration process I, I was very very aware of that problem and that issue um, and it was something that I tried to fix and remedy um, I should have fixed it and re remedied that problem early on in this stage of the illustration process like I, I should have caught on right around this time that it was getting too dark because um, yeah looking back at it you know me watching this video I realized that I was already getting too dark at the very beginning and I didn't even notice that like that should have been a warning sign for me early on hey this piece is getting too dark I should have fixed this early on um, so yeah uh, towards the end of this illustration I remember you know when it was really getting close to being done being close to being finished I, I remember posting it in a bunch of different groups and a bunch of different forums asking for opinions and critiques and that was one of the things that keeps coming up was that the value was off. It was either too dark or the background was too light, you know. Um, the, and what I mean by the background is like that background sky. Not necessarily the background trees, but that background sky was too bright in comparison to like the overall darkness of the piece. Like it just, it wasn't going, it wasn't flowing. Um, so yeah. Uh, now that I'm looking back at the very initial beginning phase of the illustration, I realized that all those problems were present at the very beginning and I should have paid more attention to it. I got so, you know, obsessed and with laying out where everything was going to be, you know, that I didn't pay attention to the value. So yeah let that be a learning lesson for you guys always pay attention to the value range um, 
Okay, I'm actually seeing myself mess around with the value range now because I guess I caught on that it might be too dark. Uh, still a little too dark though. Those little tweaks I did <laughs> did not do a whole lot. But yeah, let me be your learning tool or learning example. Always pay attention to your value range because if your value range is off, it's not going to make a good looking photo. So yeah, pay attention to that. So here I am doing another layer of outline sketches just to help me figure out where some of these details are going to land. All of these sketches are just rough. Um, they'll change all throughout the illustration.
Um, I think now would be a great time to talk about um, why I love concept art so much. Um, the art market is very vast and very varied. There's a lot of segments to it. Um, and you know, if I was to divide, you know, the art market, there is your fine art market and then there's your commercial market. And you know, those I guess would be your two biggest division. And then obviously under fine art market, you have your multiple genres um that goes under it. You also have multiple um subsets in under the commercial market. Um <clears throat> so yeah, uh, concept art uh, typically falls under the domain of the commercial art market, and um, I, I, you know, I went to a fine art school. You know, uh, I went to university in North Texas and went through the art program. Well, did not finish the art program. <laughs> Let me take that back because I did switch my major halfway through my college career. But at one point in time, I was going through the fine art program, and University of North Texas is very fine art focused, essentially, and it's a good thing, you know. Uh, the fine art market is a, a very awesome market. Um, but yeah, um, he, one would think that I would have ended up or ended up developing myself as a fine artist instead of a commercial artist. Just because you know my experience was with a fine art university instead of you know a commercial art market you know design university, uh, but for me I really ended up loving the concept art industry um, because of the world building aspects of it. Um, and I guess before I proceed to talk about more in depth about why I, I love the concept art industry, um, uh, I guess for clarification for people who's not very familiar with, you know, the art market and concept art in general, which <laughs> would be rare because, you know, if you're watching my channel, more than likely you are an artist yourself, and if you are an artist, you would know what a concept. <laughs> what the concept art is or what the concept art industry or what the concept art world is but if you happen to be one of the few people that just happen to be in my channel and you just feel like watching me you know I appreciate you for watching me then for clarification uh, purposes uh, I'll quickly explain what the concept art industry is basically uh, a concept artist is task to do world building and what I mean about world building is that um, he uh, that artist the concept artist is typically tasked to design everything that would be contained within any given world so to clarify this further um, let's just talk about Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland that was like the first movie they came to my head um, Tim Burton decides he wants to do, do an Alice in Wonderland movie well before he goes to production he kind of wants to you know get illustrations get concept art and to give him ideas on what that world would look like you know from the fashion of the characters from the look of the creatures from the vehicle designs of that world from the environments I mean he needs to know everything about that world and this is when the concept artist comes in you know the concept artist is tasked to design that world and the reason why I love the concept art community community is because they're not exactly like you know pegged into one niche you know if you're a concept artist you will be designing everything from doorknobs all the way to architecture you know and that's what's so intriguing about the concept art community is that you're everything you're like every artist you are a fashion designer you are an architect you are a vehicle designer 
you are a biologist because you have to design creatures and then you have to come up with scientific reasons as to why those creatures look like that you know um so yeah i mean a concept artist is kind of like an all around swiss army knife kind of artist because he has to he or she has to basically conceptualize and imagine a lot you know and so i guess out of all the commercial art community i was really drawn to the concept art industry just because of this world building aspect of it you know because it gets very very involved um so yeah um and talking about alice in wonderland this is off the top of my head i i was going to suggest to you guys to check out michael kutch i think that's how you say his name he was a character concept artist for the movie alice in wonderland and i kid you not he is a phenomenal character artist the designs he came up with for the alice in wonderland movies are awesome they're very very superb and if I'm not wrong, he actually did such a good job that he was asked to also design the, uh, man, why am I, the Winnie the Pooh movie. <laughs> I was going to say the Tigger movie, but I'm like, no, that's Tigger is not the main character. It's Winnie the Pooh. Uh, Michael Kutch was tasked to design the Winnie the Pooh characters for Winnie the Pooh movie. Um. So yeah, amazing artist. Uh, that's who the concept artist character designer was for that particular movie. So, but yeah, that's what concept artist concept artist does, and that's what the concept art is. You know, they're focused on world building. <clears throat> now, the reason why I mention this is because this is essentially what I'm doing in this illustration. Um, I was given the prompt, you know, value of the rules, design what this world would look like, what is the, you know, value of the rules would look like. And, and in my head, what developed was this swampy valley of some sort, you know, that has magical trees that glow. And, and within these trees are symbols that represents like some form of religious teaching or something or some form of ethical teaching of some sort you know so I, I guess you could say the glowing runes or the glowing symbols would be considered the rules of this valley and that scholars such as the priest that you know I've put in into this illustration you know they frequent this area this flooded valley because you know they're studying the rules you know so yeah um this is kind of like the world that developed in my head you know after i saw that photo of those two kids rowing their boats in the swamp area you know uh so uh yeah this is <laughs> the world that developed out of my head um and I actually wrote like a little blurb, like a little sci-fi, you know, scenario blurb based on that story uh, when I posted this on, I believe, DeviantArt.com. I don't think I have the blurb in ArtStation because ArtStation kind of limits how much information you could put in the information area. But uh, if I'm not wrong, yeah, I wrote this little blurb in, in DeviantArt.com. And so I have this little story to go along with with this uh, illustration but yeah um, so I guess to further illuminate where my ideas were coming from and how were they being shaped it was because of a the prompt and um, the photo that I saw influenced me to go this route and of course my love for the whole world building concepts or world building aspect of concept art that kind of you know gave me this idea to come up with this whole scenario about priests and their lovely servant robots so yeah
So if I'm not wrong, I think about this point in time, um, I have pretty much worked on the background and pretty much kind of uh, done for the most part with the background. Like I, I knew that I wasn't going to add any more or take away from it. You know, I, I know I did some color adjustments in the background, but for the most part, uh, the background is what it is. And the way I had it set up in my head, how everything was going to be, was that there was going to be a base layer with everything so far in it that I've done. See, I'm about to split things up right here. And, and I mentioned this about all the layers that I used on this. But to further explain the layers I use on this, my base paint, the base layer, has the background. And I pretty much finished working in the background. Um, the selection I'm making right now is the foreground. I'm basically cutting out all the areas that I would want to be in the foreground. So I copy them, put them in a separate layer. Now the tricky part about the foreground layer is that the foreground layer is going to be divided into two. There's going to be the foreground layer that's above water, which is this part right here. And then there's going to be the foreground layer that's going to be underwater. And I split them all up because I thought that this would be the best way for me to paint everything. Because the thing with the underground part is that it's not going to be seen completely. Um, if you were to look at any clear uh, rivers or clear skies, you will notice that the underground part sometimes get uh, obstructed by reflections and by the waves that the water that the water makes you know so it's not always clear essentially is what I'm trying to get at um, and so since I know that I, I know that I can't paint the back the underwater scene like like it's completely opaque I basically have to turn down the opacity of it and that's what I did um, in my layer setup is that the underground scene or the underwater scene is in a separate layer by itself and I think I might have set it to just like 50% or something you know so it's kind of like a see-through kind of thing going on so basically the underwater scene is on top of the base layer and the base layer kind of has like uh, the base colors of the water and so when I set the underwater layer to 50% that base color of the top of the water will show through and later on you'll see that that's basically kind of like how the layers are interacting with each other and so yeah um, it was kind of a complicated setup in my head because uh, typically I just work with I just typically just work on one layer you know like a traditional artist on a canvas I just type, typically paint over everything that I do um, in, in a studio setting you know a lot of people do layers and stuff or I mean I guess artists in general some artists um, are just used to like doing layers and whatnot me on the other hand uh, fall into the camp of like <laughs> let's paint everything in one layer because I love to blend you know some artists don't like to blend they just kind of uh, keep it rough and whatnot they especially do the whole texture thing uh, for me on the other hand I, I think I'm pretty much into the whole let's blend everything <laughs> you know um, so yeah um, but anyways uh, so yeah that's how pretty much my layers are set up right now and right now what was going on in the video is that I'm pretty much setting all this up uh, I'm pretty much you know I'm, I'm still not concerned into or I'm still not concerned about uh, detailing everything uh, I'm not concerned with putting all the finer touches you know for now I just want the overall look of the foreground that's above water I want the overall look of the foreground underwater and I, I actually you know at, at this point I, I don't even think I'm worried about the look of the top of the water because that was that is something that I have to worry about too how the waves were gonna look and whatnot um, so yeah for now I'm just worried about 
the background well actually I just finished the background so I'm not even worried about the background and as you can see I actually you know hid the background because I knew that I wasn't going to be working in the background anymore that's why you have that dark blue all plain color layer the reason why I put that on there is because I, I didn't want the background to distract me because I knew I was pretty much done with it um, so yeah uh, right now all I'm setting up are, are the water lilies the water lilies went in its own layer um, and I was gonna put the water lilies on top of the on top of the top of the water layer the painting of the water top of the water layer the waves um, and then all of those two layers were gonna be on top of the underwater layer so yeah it's very complicated setup if you slow down the video you will notice how things are laid out but it's going to be more apparent towards the end because when I was making this I kind of had the idea in my head how I wanted to structure everything but you know since I'm in the flux stage the stage where you know I'm still kind of semi photo bashing things in, I'm still not in the detailing phase I'm still like doing lighting adjustments and color adjustments and whatnot um, since I'm still in the middle of that you know the layers are all kind of in the flux you know I add some take away some merge some and whatnot and then eventually once I start getting into the whole detailing phase then you'll start really noticing uh, the differences or the you'll really notice the layers So here I am adding a lot more um, photos in to it. the reason why I do all this photo bash is so that I could have some form of details that I could work on or work with you know kind of like guideline shapes for me in a way so yeah all this photos I'm kind of just like laying on top of each other and whatnot and, and yeah kind of just messing around with the opacity levels and blending modes um, and I'm always constantly zooming out like every single time like I add a photo to try and photo bash in you know I'm like always zooming out just to see if they balance with everything else that I put on there 
So yeah. It's a good way to get really good amount of details. And um, again, before I forget, uh, the photos I'm using are from uh, textures.com, another great place to get royalty free photos from. Um, so yeah, I use it a lot in, I, I use their textures a lot from in my work. Now that the flowers are being put in, I wanted to quickly mention how I, I made such a huge error on the flowers in this one and I couldn't believe that I didn't catch on this early. I mean, um, yeah, I, I didn't even notice how big those flowers are. That's my main gripe with those flowers. Um, I didn't realize how big those flowers are until after the illustration is done and I, I would look at that finished illustration and I was like wow those flowers are huge <laughs> that, that blue flower that I put on there it's the size of a human face I'm like wow there's no flowers like that that exist in this world and, and I should have paid close attention to that when I'm laying all this out when I'm doing all this photo bashing uh, I should have totally paid attention to it uh, but I did it <laughs> so yeah I didn't notice how obnoxiously huge are the flowers are until after later but I guess in a way that you know the flowers being huge is kind of like a cool little thing to see in this you know made up world so since I'm kind of doing a world building with this scene anyways you know I in a way it's okay to have the flowers that big because if this world actually does exist you know there might be the possibility that the flowers are really that huge you know I mean who knows right but yeah my original intention for the flowers were to be normal size, not to be the size that they ended up as. I love that fabric texture. I use that fabric texture a lot. It looks very uh, Incan or very Native American Incan. Or even Mayan actually. So now that I've laid all those details in, you can see that with all those photos all kind of laid on top of each other, you know, I could have had the option of just letting it be um, and just simply adding shadows and maybe a few marks just to uh, kind of give a, an idea of edges, essentially. but. Instead of just going the simple route, I, you know, went ahead and did a little blending with all those details in, just because that's the style I like, you know. Uh, if I'm pressed for time, I wouldn't have spent as much time, you know, detailing all the, blending all the details in and just making sure that they all look harmoniously. I would have just left it 
as is right now because as is right now actually would look like it would just work you know but no um after all this photo bashing phase i spent you know a long time detailing all this details in like a very very long time in fact i spent half of the 55 hours that i spent on this uh, half of it was spent on detailing actually if i'm not wrong So here I am, I'm about to split the foreground because initially I work on the foreground all as one piece and I think right about now I'm about to split them into the top of the water part and then the underwater part if I'm not wrong. Yeah, it looks like I'm about to split them into two. Yeah, so and for that photo bashing sequence I ended up combining the foreground, the top of the foreground part and then the underwater foreground part I combined them into one layer first photo bash everything I needed you know and then merge it into that layer and then take that layer and then cut it in half the bottom half gonna be underwater the top part gonna be above the water Here I am, I'm beginning to detail. I was actually wrong. I thought that uh, half of the time was devoted to detailing and blending and making everything look good. It turns out about two thirds of the time, which I should have known that, yeah, about two thirds of my time really is spent on detailing because the photo bashing part, you know, I, I think I mentioned this um, in another video. Um, the photo bashing part for me goes by really quick actually you know I, I probably do you know the majority of my photo bash in a, in two or three sessions um, and those I, and I typically work in one hour sessions just to clarify so when I mean like three sessions uh, I, I guess that's another way of saying three hours um, so yeah a great deal of the time was just spent on doing what i'm doing right now which is kind of you know marking the edges of everything i see you know so that the leaves are clearer and the the tree is clearer or the the not the tree but the bark of the tree is clearer and which part are the hanging vibes and which part are 
of the tree is glowing and whatnot. So yeah, I'm slowly going over it. I'm also adding highlights on the leaves so that it looks more like leaves. But yeah, slowly painting in. This is the best part uh, of any of the work um, that I do. Like when when I do long illustrations like this. Um, after the photo bashing part, like the majority of photo bashing, because I, I think I mentioned this earlier, I I do a lot of photo bashing sessions, right? But the majority of them are all like in the middle, you know. I might photo bash towards the end of the painting, you know, like once or twice, but the majority of the photo bashing happens at the beginning and like right before the detailing process, which is like right around the middle part of the however many hours I'm working um but yeah um so yeah we just got done with the photo bashing part essentially um uh, and I, I actually think I mentioned this too in the other uh another video that the photo bashing part actually goes by really quick for me um after I'm happy with everything that I laid down uh the detailing part is the part that takes over and the detailing part is the part I love the most because once I feel confident about the overall look of everything this is the part where it just feels so zen for me because you know once I start detailing I don't have to think hard about how that leaf is gonna look or how that vine is gonna look or how that robot is gonna look like I don't have to think hard about any of those things anymore because the photos and the textures that I you know bash into that layer kind of gives an indication of where things are going to be anyways like a good uh, example would be that uh, small little plant right next to that tree right now like you can see that there's leaves right there but they're kind of fuzzy right and but at least I know where the leaves were gonna go you know so like once I start detailing those out all I need to do is just kind of go back and just you know mark the edges of those leaves you know and so the detailing part is the fun part for me even though it is the longest trust me it, it is one of the it is the longest part of the process for me but it's also the most fun because like i said i don't i'm not thinking hard at this point in time you know I, i'm not troubleshooting any lighting issues anymore i'm not troubleshooting any shape issues anymore or any perspective issues anymore i'm just detailing i'm just making sure that everything is reading correctly and looking good so yeah this is the fun part this is my zen part this is the part where i could just listen to Pandora's 80s music and sing along to Madonna while painting because that's what I do I sing and dance and draw all at the same time so yeah every now and then I catch a snag though like in this part right here I realize that the human people are kind of like fuzzy for me so I would go back and do an outline sketch real quick just to help me figure out where things are. Eventually I ended up replacing what I painted in with um, with 3D characters created by the Manuel Bestioni lab. I love that little piece of software. Um, for, you, for any of you guys who wants to use a quick human reference, um, what you can do is download Blender and then download the MB Lab plugin. The Manuel Bestioni Lab plugin, the original one, kind of faded away, um, but then it got replaced by the MB Lab plugin. Um, but yeah, download that plugin because what that plugin does is that it creates uh, characters for you. So, um, and then you can just light that character however you want and then use that character for whatever project you needed so in this case I originally was intending to just draw the characters out by myself you know but I was having issues with the lighting and the proportion that I was just like you know what I'm gonna use a 3d character creation uh, software you know it would speed things up for me instead of me having to like go back over and over the face again just to get you know the look right so yeah but you'll eventually see me uh, use this software later on.
So here's my first robot. Um, and if you happen to have seen the robot cat sketch video that I did, I talked a lot about Baroque design and how lately I've been obsessed with combining Baroque designs with robot figures. Um, it doesn't show often in a lot of my illustrations but every now and then it will pop up and this is one of those illustrations where I have like the Baroque robot style going on and I'm trying to explore what it would look like essentially. Um, I'm not too happy with my results so far with my experiment with my Baroque robot experiments. I mean the robots in this particular illustration they came out nicely you know they came out well rendered uh, I love how I rendered them but as for the overall design aspect of the Baroque robots I'm not too happy with it. Uh, I feel like it could still be worked on so yeah I really love how I detailed the leaves in this particular illustration. Um, I just thought it just came out very, very nicely. So you could pretty much could kind of see how the layers are set out um, right about now if you take a look on the right side. Um, oh well <laughs> now it's back to the navigator or OV view. But yeah uh, as I've mentioned before um, the foreground layer is uh, the foreground, the underwater foreground layer's opacity is set fairly low. So that the face paint at the bottom would show, would show through. So yeah, the detailing process is just pretty much a simple process. Um, I mark the edges, I straighten out the edges so that the edges are clear. Um, blend some colors that needed to be blending. I don't do a whole lot of blending actually, but you know, I kind of just make things look smooth in a way. And I add highlights and add shadows, rinse and repeat. Uh, that's pretty much what. I do. Uh, you could kind of see it in the leaves that I'm working on right now. It's just same process over and over again. You know, mark the edges, figure out where the leaves are, kind of straighten them out, make them look more leaf-like, 
Um, so yeah. In this particular plant, uh, I'm planning on some of the leaves to uh, be on top of the water. So you could kind of see that, you know, I kind of shape it to where it's kind of touching water essentially. <coughs> Excuse me. So these leaves that we're looking at right now, um, before I added the edges and detailed them, um, the overall look of it um, was pretty much dictated by the photos that I bashed into my layer earlier. Uh, and then when I blended everything in, it looks a lot more painterly than photo, photo wise, you know, which is kind of what I uh, like or I prefer I prefer the more painterly look rather than the um, super detailed f photographic look that a lot of photo bash pieces have technically though like the the flowers on top of the trees and all that foliage on top of the trees I didn't blend those nowhere near as much as I feel like I should have um, these separate plants uh, that's in the water this smaller uh, plants they got a lot better treatment when it comes to detailing because it's more painterly look versus the trees so you can tell that I spent a lot more time on it And here comes the characters that I grabbed from Manuel Bastioni Lab. 
Um, once again, I didn't uh, record my setup of this, but if you download the software and if you download um, the plugin, it's pretty self-explanatory, really. Just press a few buttons and it will automatically create a character for you. And so here I am using those two photos that I got from uh, the lab. And I'm kind of just smudging things a little bit, blending things a little bit so it doesn't look so rendered. Uh, so that I could kind of have like a painterly quality to it. And then I'm coming back and repainting some of the details that I lost when I blended stuff in. But yeah, it's a lot more painterly look. Now obviously that looks like way better than what I have originally. I could have fixed the one I had there, you know, if I just kept working on it, but, you know, time's off the essence and I wanted to save some time, so um, I used all my available tools to save some time. I wasn't exactly sure how to do the highlights uh, on the symbols. Um, typically when you have glowing stuff, the area around it is has highlights. And uh, I wasn't really sure how the area surrounding the glowing symbols would look like. So I kind of just, you know, wing it. <laughs> Those highlights I drew in, I mean, they look functional. They don't look super realistic, but, you know, they look like it could look like it could look like that. <laughs> so, yeah, I just tried my best. I mean, there's a beauty of art, you know, <laughs> if you have no reference to reference. Um, or if you have nothing to kind of help guide you, you know, you kind of just wing it and just make it look as good as best as you can. So yeah. But yeah, those highlights that I put around the symbols, um, they're looking kind of weird for me right now. I could see it happening in real life though, that's the thing. Like I could understand why I did what I did. You know, because it could it could look like that in real life, but it doesn't quite look realistic.
So at this point, the two back trees and the small plants uh, surrounding the trees are, for the most part, pretty much done. Which leaves the two big trees in the foreground and the two characters, the praying guy and the robot servant is the only uh, thing left for me to detail. And oh yeah, the underwater part too. Um, totally forgot I haven't worked on it. Here's some late minute photo bashing for me. I decided I wanted some photos to use for the vines. So I took that photo that I that we were just looking at and took the stems from there and kind of used that as my vines that kind of, you know, flow around the trees. So right now I'm making a selection, a um, marquee selection for my foreground. Um, all the way throughout the painting, um, the details I add would kind of change the sh overall shape of the foreground. So I'm just reselecting everything so that um, when I do my mask, when I put in my mask, they're all correct. I did this quite a few times throughout the illustration. Just refining the selection over and over again whenever I, after I'm done painting a certain particular area.
So there I am, redefining the foreground again with the mask. I really love the fish details that I put in this illustration. Um, the sad part though is that they're not very obvious. I, I don't really think that people know that there are fishes in the illustration just because they're so subtle and so small uh, and obviously underwater that I don't think people realize that they're there. But yeah, they're there. There's fishes in the illustration very very subtle but they exist
before I forget, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, retract an earlier statement of mine regarding University of North Texas art program. I actually just remembered that they do have uh, a, a commercial art program or a graphic design program. Uh, but when I went through that program, I think they call it or when, when I was going there, I think they called it communication design, I think is what it was called. So yeah, um, I retract my earlier statement that uh, University of North Texas Art Department is more focused on fine art because it's actually half and half. Uh, they have a very robust uh, art program. Let's just uh, say it. <laughs> Let me just say it that way. Let me put it that way. So yeah. I'm looking at the bottom right section of my video right now and trying to remind myself like how I set up the layers um, and if you rewind back a little bit or actually if you just keep watching um, right now I have the overview tab active but every now and then when when I'm doing some layer work I switch back to the layers tab um, but in my layers tab, like uh, every now and then in the video, when you see it act, uh, when you see it active in the in view, you will see how um, I typically work with layers. Um, when I was doing the mushrooms and I was photo bashing it in, you kind of see me do multiple layers and multiple copies of it. Um, multiple copies of it and um, you know like all those different layers have like different li light settings and whatnot and once is once I'm ready basically to you know kind of integrate it into my paint layer I all merge it into my paint layer so yeah I was just kind of pointing that out because I know that earlier I was talking about how I how I work with layers essentially and how I try to keep it um, in one layer as much as I can so yeah There it is. Uh, my layers tab is active right now. And I'm activating, reactivating them just to, you know, look at the current scene, making sure that everything is looking okay. Um, again, like I said, I took out the background because I figured it's much easier for me to work on the foreground and a separate view or it would be just much nicer if I could just concentrate concentrate on the foreground not have to worry so much about the background and how everything else was going to interact so that's why I was pinning it like this but yeah uh, once it's time for me to check to see you know how all the stuff that I added kind of flows into you know the overall look I would turn everything back on and take out this blue plain blue layer which I name as the temp background layer if you look at my layers tab right now
but yeah here I am detailing uh, this tree on the left uh, just kind of adding some highlights and some shadows and kind of just making it look like uh, the flowers are fairly well read or that you could read that it's flowers fairly easily So whenever I'm painting in Krita, um, I'm always switching back and forth um, the horizontal position um, or I basically turn on mirror image um, that's what the option is called under Krita and the, re the reason why I you know switch to the inverted um, mirror image is because it helps me kind of look at it from a different angle or look at the piece from you know a totally different point of view and whenever I do this it kind of helps me you know see things that I was not seeing before or uh, I was kind of missing so it's always very good to always just flip the canvas every now and then just so that you know you could get a good sense of proportion and perspective just to see if it's balanced uh, when you look at it left or right um, you can use the same technique when you do traditional art uh, when you do tr traditional art obviously you can't flip your drawing onto the other side so what uh, traditional artists do is that they grab a mirror and they hold it right next to their artwork so that they could look at the mirror image of their artwork and then they do their they they do their troubleshooting um, by looking through the mirror so yeah good technique to use um, when you're painting
I didn't spend as much time on the robot's legs because I knew that it was going to be underwater. So I decided, you know what, I'm not going to detail it as much as I detail the top part of the robot. I just breezed through those details fairly quick, I realized. Right now I'm updating my mask so that um, I can have an up-to-date uh, version of it essentially. 
that I could turn on and off when, when I needed to check the status of the overall painting since I'm painting it all separately. And here's another Manuel Bastioni character that I decided to use for my illustration.
So I'm basically tweaking the background at this point because somebody mentioned it was too light and then it was too distracting uh, and sort of competing with the lights in the fair front so I went ahead and turned it down turned the brightness down in the background essentially which required a lot of edits because yeah, <laughs> just required a lot of edits essentially to make everything look good. So as soon as I turn um, the brightness down, and I did it by using the curves uh, function. As soon as I used the curves filter and turned down the brightness, I just went ahead and just smoothed everything back. Or I smoothed everything all together and blended everything all together essentially. Detailing the fishes, one of my favorite parts of this illustration. They're so small though, you could barely see them.
Now, I haven't exactly taken the time to talk to you guys about the software that I'm using. Um, I know I mentioned the uh, Krita software a few times in this video, uh, as well as uh, my other videos. So, um, I guess I'll just go ahead and talk about it real quick, because I just realized I never really talked about Krita. Um, and I'm not sure if it's pronounced the way I'm pronouncing it, which is I'm pronouncing it Krita. So uh, I guess let me know if I'm wrong or whatnot. But the software I'm using is an open source software. It is free. There are paid versions of it uh, available in the Windows Store as well as the Steam Store if I'm not wrong. And the reason why they have the paid version is uh, they just basically have it to help um, to help the developers essentially you know I mean their time is very important and they spend a lot of time developing this program so uh, yeah there are paid versions of it but there is a free version which you can download directly from their website website krita.org um, anyways uh, the software is really really good for the longest time I was on Photoshop CS2 um, Oh no no I was wrong. I'm wrong sorry uh, Photoshop CS4 that was my longest software for the longest time or that was the software I was using for the longest time and I was looking for a very good substitute for a while uh, I really wanted to use GIMP um, I, I wanted to replace my Photoshop CS4 with GIMP but the thing with GIMP though is that it was it's designed differently um, it doesn't have uh, the same workflows that I'm used to when it comes to Photoshop. Um, so even though I tried GIMP, I just keep going back to Photoshop essentially. And then eventually I found Krita and I was surprised that the workflow that Krita has is very very similar to the kind of workflows that I have in Photoshop. and so I decided to make the switch and just well I just never looked back you know um, so yeah I've been a Krita user for about two to three years now um, and it's been a great program so far um, I've, I've loved it so far um, all the stuff that they've put into the program and all the improvements and whatnot has just been phenomenal it's just been a very nifty program um, so yeah uh, for the ones who want to learn digital painting and as in a budget uh, do consider Krita uh, you can find it in krita.org um, I also wanted to mention and well take the time to talk to you guys about digital painting and like the techniques that uh, most digital artists would use um, even though I'm a credit user and I was a Photoshop user, uh, the the thing with digital painting softwares though is that they're very very similar to each other. Uh, the workflows might be different, but the same principle are very very similar. Um, in, in the case of like GIMP, um, Photoshop, or Krita, or Arc Rage, which is another painting software that I've tried that uh, I fell in love with, and what actually uh, Arc Rage was actually the software that got me started back into digital painting. Um, anyways, um, the the thing with all these digital painting softwares, though, is that they have very very similar uh, mechanisms. Um, so if you're in the market for um, a digital painting software the, the thing that you really need to consider is whether or not they have the main important things which is for, for me the main important things I consider anyway in a digital painting software um, it's a brush engine brush engine is very very important and you will find for a brush engine in Photoshop CS4 or CS um, whatever it is now I know they switch over to a subscription model but um, uh, Photoshop CC 2019 or whatnot, um, 
and that one is Brush Engine as well as Krita as well as GIMP as well as Artrage as well as a lot of the pinning software so you know if a pinning software has a Brush Engine then you're good <laughs> you can start working with that software uh, another thing to consider would be layers and blending modes uh, those are again uh, important things to consider when you're you know wanting a digital painting software um, now the reason why I mentioned this is because obviously there's some uh, painting software out there that is very very limited and the first thing that comes to my mind is Microsoft Windows Paint which I haven't been on Windows for a while now so I don't know what Microsoft Windows Paint is like now but I know before you know it has a very very simple brush engine uh, I don't even think it has like opacity settings or pen pressure settings um, and I know for a fact that when two three years ago it didn't have like layers nor blending modes which I feel is very very important um, so yeah, don't use Microsoft Paint <laughs> unless it has a good brush engine now and the layer and blending modes then yeah, maybe he could use it. Um, but yeah, those would be the main things I would consider uh, in picking my painting software. Um, which in all honesty, you know, uh, it doesn't even really matter what software you use and that's the reason why I don't talk so much about Krita in in my channel even though it is my main painting software and the reason why I don't talk so much about it is because what really matters the most is is your skill is you know if you practice daily if you do art daily if you draw on an actual sketchbook like I do like I have my own actual sketchbook pen and paper that I draw on regularly um, so long as you have those things and you constantly practice, it doesn't even really matter what tools you use, you know. Um, you can have a pencil and that's it and draw really, really good artwork, do really, really good artwork. Way better than this. Um, way better than what I'm doing. And you, all you have is just pencil and paper, you know. I mean, it is possible. Um, so yeah, tools doesn't matter as much, it's the skills and it's the fundamentals, you know. You need to practice the fundamentals to get really good at something. And then you can just bend all the tools to whatever you want it to do, so yeah. But if you are looking for a good software, Krita is a very good software, so yes. That's my advertisement for today.
I had a hard time delineating all these flowers. Um, so hard for me to figure out where the edges were, so I had to guess a lot. <laughs> But yeah, it still came out good though. Here I am, I'm about to split the foreground into the two pieces or into the two different parts that I was talking about. Uh, the foreground is going to be above water and the foreground is going to be underwater. Um, so yeah. So there's the underwater foreground set at 50% um, just to kind of indicate some form of being of the water being uh, see-through. Here I am repainting the water part essentially. Um, the values has already been set pretty much by my earlier paint. Um, I'm just essentially just redoing everything just to make it look uh, a lot cleaner than what it was before. Krita has a water brush by the way, um, it's a brush that kind of simulates waves uh, on a body of water. It's the brush I use for this particular painting, it's a very good brush. Stamp water <laughs> is the, what the brush is called, I just saw its name in the lower left corner.
So I'm about to do some very complicated um, layering uh, setup. Essentially, the way uh, I have my file set up is that I have my base paint, obviously, where pretty much everything was. I do believe that the foreground, the top foreground, I ended up merging with my base paint eventually. And so all I have for the foreground is pretty much the underwater part, which I set at 50%. And then I copied the water part, this part that I'm painting right now. I actually copied this uh, layer, or I copied the water into its own separate layer. And I did um, kind of like this complicated thing uh, with this layer. Essentially, I have three different versions of it and there's versions where the the darkest part of the water is see-through and only the light is showing and there was a copy of this layer where it was opposite where the dark parts of the water was the one that is not see-through and the light part was see-through and the reason why I did this was because I wanted to have a finer control of you know what gets shown through the water essentially so I have this layer three separate or three different times or basically I copy the water layer like three different times and have it set on different gradients where the dark was showing and the light was not and then another one where the light was showing and the dark was not and vice versa and whatnot so so yeah, I have three layers of water essentially, and I have a layer for reflection, which really you couldn't even really tell what the reflection was, um, but it was something that I did really quick quickly, and I know that reflection is um, happens in, realistically, so I guess I just wanted that little touch of reflection in it just for a touch of realism even though it's hardly noticeable in the final illustration but yeah I have a reflection layer I also have a layer that um, for the water lilies um, another layer for final paint overs and then the last layer is pretty much the light um, with all the layers that I put on top of the water uh, some of the underwater lights uh, or underwater symbols were was getting very very dark and so I essentially adding ended up adding another layer for for the underwater symbols to make it glow a little bit brighter so but that's eventually how I ended up doing my layers essentially and uh, you could see me set all of those layers up right now um, I'm going through the whole process of deciding where everything was going to go so yeah here I am copying the water I think I'm trying to copy the water I think it's what I'm about to do and I'm about to put it all put it in its own separate layer and then duplicate that three times with different effects and put different effects on those two duplicates There's my water layer and here I am adjusting the gradient on it taking out the darkest parts well not anymore you can't see it anymore because I'm doing something else 
but you can kind of see the effect going right now where the darkest part is almost transparent and then the light part the light part has uh, more of the water so yeah and then, then I did this three separate times with different uh, settings and there's the reflection layer I don't know if you guys noticed that this is the reflection layer which I pretty much just ended up blurring out like I painted this quickly and just kind of just set everything in on blur because I know that it wasn't going to be very obvious and I didn't want it to be very obvious because uh, if I may ha if I had made this reflection layer a lot more obvious then what ended what would have ended up happening was I would have lost all of the underwater effects that I was trying to go for which is that whole see-through kind of deal so yeah that's why I ended up just blurring out most of that reflection and putting it very very lightly or uh, putting it in a very light opacity and then here I am tweaking the water again and then of course my water lilies that I like so much and then here's my uh, here's the layer that brightens up that brightens up the underwater symbols so yeah lots and lots of tweaking going on and if you look to the right lower right you could pretty much see my layers all set up and yeah that's pretty much how I had everything set up and yeah for the most part I think this painting is pretty much done uh, I guess right about now I'm just doing some tweaks finalizing some things uh, Right now, I'm obviously blurring the edges of the underwater scene so that it doesn't look so jarring. Uh, but yeah, there it is.
so I did a last minute curve edit on my piece because somebody was saying that it was beginning to look too dark so here I am lightening things up and then obviously I have to edit all those uh, brightness out or let me rephrase it since I lighten some of the scene with the brightness curve settings I have to go back and redo some of the shadows essentially because some of the shadows some of the shadows just got too bright so yeah that's what I'm doing right now some last minute light adjustments
so yeah after all those last minute um edits uh brightness edits um after those edits pretty much uh, everything's pretty much done and over uh, i'm just going back and just refining some things some little nuances that uh, is kind of disturbing me so i figured i'd kind of fix it real quick but yeah for the most part this painting is done uh, this illustration is complete um, so yeah Thanks for watching it with me. Like and subscribe. Good night.